Hey guys, it's Danny. Today it is time for a new episode of our Orchid Care for Beginners series. And in today's episode, we are going to learn how to care for Oncidiums and Oncidium type orchids, which I believe are the second most popular orchid on the market right now. And the good news is they are just as easy to care for as Phalaenopsis. They're just a little bit different. Speaking about which, if you missed our previous videos on Phalaenopsis care and also Cattleya orchid care, I'll link you to all of them down below in the description. Today's episode, along with our entire Orchid Care for Beginners series, is sponsored by Repotme.com, who offers you everything you could possibly need to properly take care of your orchid from media to fertilizer, pots, and all sorts of accessories. Some of the accessories that I will use in this care series and in today's video are provided by Repotme, so I will link you to their website down below in the description, feel free to visit them at any time. With that said, let's start by learning a little bit about the different types of Oncidiums and their growth pattern. Oncidium orchids are a very, very diverse group of orchids. And on the market, we can find many different types of hybrids, which for the most part are intergeneric. This means that several genera within the Oncidium Alliance have been hybridized to obtain new and wonderful looking and smelling individuals. And because of this multitude of hybrids available on the market, Oncidiums can be found under various different names. First, we have the so-called proper Oncidium, and the most popular of them all is the Oncidium Sherry Baby, also known as the chocolate orchid, and this is because it absolutely smells like chocolate. It is a must-have for any fragrant flower enthusiast. As we can see, this Oncidium has very tiny flowers produced in large numbers. Due to the shape of the flowers, these orchids are also called dancing ladies. If we can imagine that the lip is a skirt, then we can see why the resemblance. But then come the related genera, such as the brassias, which are also known as the spider orchids. Even though they are still oncidium type orchids, they do have a very spidery shape to their flowers, but they do actually take very, very similar care and culture. The Miltonia has a star-shaped flower, a little less spidery than the Brassia. Nonetheless, though, it is very, very beautiful and again takes pretty much the same care and culture. Then we have the Miltoniopsis, the so-called pansy orchid. Again, it is an Oncidium type orchid, it is related, however, it has a genus of its own and furthermore, it takes different care and culture. Another genus is the Odontoglossum, which is characterized by its very symmetrical flower. I like to call it square-shaped, although it's not square, it certainly has more compact flowers, if you will, than the other genera. Along with these genera, there are others on the market, which can vary in size and shape, but they're all related to Oncidiums, they have similar characteristics, and furthermore, they can be crossed together. On the market, we will also find a lot of hybrids. Actually, in flower shops and garden centers, we will most likely find hybrids, not species. At some point, it is so hard to determine the full parentage of an orchid that, especially here in Europe, we just decided to call all of these complex hybrids Cambria. But that's what the name stands for, a very complex hybrid, which can vary in shape, color, fragrance. Nonetheless, all of these orchids are related and to some degree they're all very similar. However, culture can vary a little bit and that can make them slightly scary for orchid beginners. But I'm here to make everything a lot easier for you guys. So now that we know a little bit more about this complex but wonderful world of Oncidiums, let's talk about how they grow, how they look like, their structures, how they bloom, and so on before we move on to culture. Unlike Phalaenopsis orchids, which are monopodial orchids, Oncidiums are sympodials, just like Cattleyas. As you know, Phalaenopsis orchids have a central stem and they grow leaves from the top, we call this a crown, and pretty much all roots and flower spikes sprout from the central stem. Well, Oncidiums are nothing like that. Instead of producing new leaves from a central stem, Oncidiums produce bulbous-like formations that we call pseudobulbs. All of these bulbs are actually connected between them through a rhizome. The rhizome is not super visible, but it is located 
at the base of the pseudobulbs and it pretty much links all of these pseudobulbs together. This means that all of these structures communicate and they are also part of the very same orchid. New growths and pseudobulbs are not brand new plants, they're not pups or offshoots, but they are part of the very same plant, pretty much like leaves. Propagation through division of these pseudobulbs is possible, but it's not optimal through individual pseudobulbs. And if you try to remove a brand new growth which is not mature just yet, chances of its survival are minimal. So do keep in mind, these orchids are not supposed to be divided individually. We will talk more about propagation and division in a totally different video. The purpose of these structures is to store nutrients and water because just like Phalaenopsis, these orchids are epiphytic, meaning they don't grow in soil. In nature, you will find them on tree trunks or tree branches, depending on variety. So they had to develop structures that would allow them to withstand several days of drought. And these structures are the pseudobulbs. Typically on the side of each pseudobulb, we will find one or two or three leaves and also one or two or three leaves on top of each pseudobulb. The shape and size of pseudobulbs can vary greatly from variety to variety. Some can be rather elongated and tall, others can be rather rounded, others might even have some ridges. Typically, with oncidiums, flower spikes sprout from next to the pseudobulb, in between the first leaf and the pseudobulb, in some cases in which varieties have multiple leaves, you can have flower spikes sprouting from the second leaf as well. And in extremely rare occasions, you can have flower spikes sprouting from the very top of the pseudobulb. This is an anomaly, it doesn't typically happen. Most flower spikes will come from between the first leaf and the pseudobulb. Oncidiums can produce one or two or even three, depending on the variety, flower spikes at the same time. And as a personal note, I did notice that spikes are more prone to arise from in between the largest leaf and the pseudobulb. Typically, next to a pseudobulb, oncidiums will have a larger leaf and a smaller leaf. Even though it's not always the case, usually flower spikes sprout from in between the largest leaf and the pseudobulb. After the flowers are spent on an oncidium type orchid, it is absolutely safe to cut the flower spike because it will not branch out and it will not create cakeys like Phalaenopsis do. So it is a great idea to go as close to the base as possible and just cut the flower spike all together. Remember to maintain hygiene and always sterilize your cutting tools whenever you work with different orchids. Shortly after the flowers are spent, within a month or two generally, but even sooner than that, you should see a new growth sprouting. This is the beginning of a new pseudobulb. New growths sprout from the last leaf on the pseudobulb, either on the outside or on the inside. They can sprout from both sides. You can have multiple growths sprouting at the same time. And at first, they will be very, very tiny. They will look like a leafy formation. And as time passes, they will elongate more and more and more until you will be able to see the individual leaves. From these new growths, a brand new root system will start to grow as well. They can start to grow when the new growth is pretty tiny or after it's completely mature. It does depend on variety and whatever species you might have, just like in the Cattleya case. But the main root producer of an Oncidium orchid is actually the new growth. The older the pseudobulb is, the less roots it will produce. Older pseudobulbs can still produce roots, but the major root system will be produced by the newest growth. It can take anywhere from four to nine months for a new growth to completely mature and look like a proper pseudobulb. Depending on variety, flower spikes can start to appear very soon after the pseudobulb is mature, or a month or two later, or even right before the pseudobulb is completely mature. And as I was saying, normally oncidiums produce one, two, or even more flower spikes, depending on variety and how healthy the orchid is. 
Flower spikes can take two to four or five months to open buds, depending on variety. In my opinion, the Sherry Baby takes the longest, together with the Oncidium Twinkle, which is another very popular Oncidium. But in the case of intergenerics, it is more common to wait about a month and a half or two before you see a flower open. Depending on variety, flower spikes can be rather tall or rather short, can branch or maybe they won't, they can rather grow upright or they can become pendant. If you enjoy the look of a pendant flower spike, it is absolutely fine to not stake the actual flower spike. However, do keep in mind that these orchids are a little bit more awkward, so be careful how you walk around them. Also, some of these flowers can be so, so large and heavy that they can actually tip over the orchid. What I like to do is place the actual orchid pot in a decorative container which is heavier, such as the clay decorative containers. But it is also perfectly fine to stake them if you feel that they're just too awkward and you fear that you might damage the flower spike. The orchid will absolutely not mind it and the flower spike will indeed be a little bit more secure. After the flowers are spent, the cycle begins once again with the formation of a new growth at the base of the pseudobulb and that pretty much will happen all of the time. Oncidiums are continuous growers, they don't have dormancies or breaks. They typically like to bloom in spring and autumn, but it is not a rule and certainly with so much variety, we cannot set a rule in stone. And even if you will have older leaves yellowing and falling, that is perfectly normal. It's not a dormancy sign, it's just old structures withering off and getting regenerated through the creation of new structures. The new growth will typically sprout from the newest pseudobulb, pretty much the one that bloomed, if you have a blooming Oncidium. But it is not uncommon for older pseudobulbs to create new growths again. And particularly if something happens to the newest pseudobulb, or if the orchid just feels that it has enough energy to create multiple growths, even older pseudobulbs can create new growths. The older pseudobulbs still have dormant eyes, and if there's something to wake them up, then they will start growing them. As I was saying, the pseudobulbs, particularly the fresh ones, will create roots. Now, these roots don't really look like Phalaenopsis roots. Typically, the root system of an Oncidium orchid is white and has green root tips. Sometimes when you water the orchid, the roots can green up, but it's not a rule. Particularly if you're growing your orchid in an opaque pot or a decorative container which does not let light reach the roots. You don't need to provide light for the roots, it is not their main purpose. Their main purpose is to absorb water and nutrients. And if they have that, they will be happy and the orchid will be happy. So these were the general traits of Oncidiums and their related hybrids, and these apply to all Oncidium type orchids. So now let's move on to care and culture, and in this department, most Oncidiums do prefer pretty much the same things, with a few exceptions that I will mention. But first of all, let's talk some general light, temperature, humidity and watering requirements which will apply to most Oncidiums and intergeneric hybrids, as well as the different genera such as the Brassia, Miltonia, the hybrids in between them such as Alisaras, Bratonias and other hybrids which we can find on the market. When it comes to light, most Oncidiums prefer pretty bright light, but not as bright as Cattleyas. Bright shade will do great for Oncidiums, and if you can provide early morning sun or late afternoon sun, that would be ideal. You can also use a sheer curtain to filter out the sun's rays. What's important is for the leaves not to overheat. That's when sunburn happens. I've discovered they can grow very well under pretty bright artificial light. They do require more light than Phalaenopsis orchids to bloom well, but certainly not as much as other orchids like Hatleas or Vandas. Temperature-wise, they're not very fussy, and they are actually pretty close to Phalaenopsis in requirements. Whatever you have in your home and you're comfortable with, they will be comfortable as well. They can withstand a bit of extremes like a little bit of heat and a little bit of cold temperatures, but they're not gonna be very, very happy about it for the main part. If you keep things intermediate to warm, they should be very happy and try your best not to keep them in freezing conditions or extreme heat for way too long. 
In terms of humidity, most of these orchids are not super fussy about it. Higher humidity will help a little bit any orchid because it limits water loss through transpiration, but typically if you maintain your Oncidium orchid properly hydrated, humidity in your home shouldn't be such a big of a problem. Speaking about watering, this is one of the more important cultural aspects for Oncidiums. They really don't like to be super bone dry and are not as tolerant to drought as Phalaenopsis and Cattleyas are. So the rule of thumb is to water these orchids when the medium is almost dry. Take a look through the pot and see if the medium has changed color to a lighter one, or if you cannot tell, since the roots don't necessarily change color like the Phalaenopsis, just touch the lower layers of the medium with your finger. If it's still slightly damp, then it's perfectly fine to water. You will notice an Oncidium starting to get dehydrated by the wrinkles on the pseudobulbs. If you see wrinkles on your orchid and you know it might be time to water, then definitely it is time to water. Even though these orchids are somewhat drought tolerant because they have storage devices, they will just not look very good if they're all wrinkly and raisin-like. Reblooming Oncidium orchids isn't hard, and there's no trick like we have with the Phalaenopsis in which we can play with the temperature to trigger a flower spike. Typically, whenever a new pseudobulb matures, if the orchid is healthy, it will bloom. Many Oncidiums choose to bloom in the spring or autumn, but it's not a rule. If the pseudobulbs are large enough, the orchid has a good root system, it receives enough light and adequate fertilizing, then it should bloom. But overall, the healthier and less stressed the orchid is, the more chances you have of it reblooming or producing a great show. As I was saying, there are a few exceptions to these care guides, and these are the Miltoniopsis and some of their close hybrids, such as the Oncidopsis. They're more intermediate growers and are not as tolerant to high temperatures. So with Miltoniopsis and Oncidopsis and other very close hybrids, it's a good idea to keep them more on the cooler side or intermediate side. They will not tolerate heat pretty much at all, so it's not a good idea to grow them outside if you have hot weather, but in parts of the world which normally don't get hot weather, they can prove to be ideal orchids. They thrive in cooler to intermediate conditions, and not only, high humidity as well. So the more ambiental humidity you have, the better for Miltoniopsis. The pansy orchids, as well as the Nelly Eiler, can prove to be slightly difficult depending on your environment. Even I have slight issues with them if they're not very healthy when I purchase them. Which brings me to our last considerant, health. Even Oncidiums can suffer from root rot, root loss and all sorts of ailments, case in which they will go through a period of extreme dehydration. You can see in this case I have a lot of wrinkling on the pseudobulb, and this is because this particular orchid has no roots. Typically what will happen is the orchid will start to produce a new growth, which will create a new root system. Most often than not, this is where the new roots will come from, not necessarily from the old pseudobulb, although it is not a rule set in stone, just a statistic. Due to the stress and lack of energy, the new growth, when mature, will probably not be the same size as the previous bulb. In extreme cases, the new pseudobulb created can be super tiny or even not completely formed at all, but rather a bunch of leaves. That is normal and to be expected given the conditions. What's important is for the orchid to actually have a good medium and good care so that a new root system starts to grow and the next growth after the, let's say, stressed or tiny growth will most probably be bigger or actual normal size. It will also have more chances to bloom, but it all depends on the health of the orchid. In this case, I have an orchid which made a full recovery, I have an extensive root system, the previous growth is rather tiny, but the new growth seems to be within the normal size for this orchid, which means the orchid is completely recovered. However, the smaller pseudobulb will never grow to the full size that it's capable of. Once mature, it will remain like this, but it doesn't mean you need to remove it. It will still store energy and nutrients, and it will in turn help all of the new growths which will be formed through the years. 
Being that they are epiphytic plants, no matter how much they would love water, they also love air. So it's not a good idea to pot these orchids into a normal potting soil. It is also a great idea to offer a pot which can provide ventilation. And all of my Oncidiums, just like the Phalaenopsis and Cattleyas and all of my orchids, are potted in pots which have extra ventilation holes or slits. I also do enjoy transparent pots because I can take a look at the root system and see how it's doing. And as for medium, a more water retentive mix is suitable. Here we have an orchid that is potted in the Repot Me Oncidium mix. I also have a video trying it out, I'll link it to you down below. This mix contains small grade Orchiata bark, which is much better at water retention than big grade bark, and also turfus and a few other materials mixed together with the bark. The aim of this mix is to be more watch retentive than let's say a cat lamb mix would be. But other materials can be used as well, such as sphagnum moss or mixes with sphagnum moss and bark. On the RepodMe website you can find these materials sold separately and they're suited for those growers who like to prepare their mix themselves. But if you're a beginner and you're not entirely sure what to choose, a potting mix can actually be a good starting point because it's already giving you the basics of what these orchids need. And as you can see, my orchid in this potting mix has done very well. But because I have so many different orchids, I do prefer to mix my own potting mixes because I can add or remove materials depending on the type of Oncidium that I have. So now let's go ahead and actually repot an Oncidium and I'll show you how I mix my potting mix. So here is a new Oncidium Twinkle that I just purchased. It is always a great idea to repot new orchids. Many of the times the medium is already old and broken down. Sometimes the orchid is just starting to outgrow its pot. And most often than not, the mixes used with these orchids are not necessarily suitable for home conditions. We can also see that new growth has already started, so I know that new roots will start to grow soon as well. This is a good time to repot any sympodial orchid, just like with cattleyas. When new roots are on their way, it is a good time to repot if a repot is necessary. So first of all, I made sure that my orchid is hydrated. A little while back, I made a video talking about the 10 tips that you should know when repotting orchids, and this was one of them hydrating orchids before repotting. I'll link you down below to that video because it really is important for you to know some things before repotting orchids. So in my case, my orchid, can we see, is not shriveled, is not wrinkly, it is hydrated, so I can go ahead and repot it. And in this case, the pot was very, very easy to remove because as we can see, the orchid is actually potted in a mesh pot and then in a normal pot. It's not typical, it depends on the nursery and where you purchase the orchid from, but we do need to remove this mesh pot as well to have access to the roots inside. And with mesh pots, it's always hard to not damage any root. And we can see I did manage to damage a few roots, but it's okay, the orchid seems to have a lot of roots. So now I'm going to remove this medium so I did remove as much medium as I could, but this will be a lot easier if I go at the sink and just run some water through the roots because this medium is actually more fine than I thought it would be. So there are no pieces for me to remove. A jet of water will do a better job. I will come back when I'm done. So here we are, the medium has been removed from the roots, but we can see a lot of dead roots. The way to know if a root is not good anymore is to pull gently on it. If the root comes off and leaves behind a string, then that root is not alive anymore. But if we look at my orchid, we can see that in the front, I do have good root tips. So roots are starting to grow in this area, but most of the roots on my orchid are not alive anymore. So I will cut most of them off. And as a little tip that I also mention in my repotting tips video, typically you will find most dead roots on the oldest side of the orchid. So this is where I will go ahead and cut all of these roots, which are just not alive anymore. With Oncidiums, you can have such extensive roots that checking each and every one individually might just not be possible. 
If you have an orchid which doesn't have an extensive root system, you can actually check each one individually. But if you have something like this, you can go ahead and just remove the roots in bulk and start from the oldest side of the orchid and just check to see what you're cutting. If the roots you're cutting do not look alive anymore, then <laughs> chances are they're not alive. Now that I have the bulk of dead roots removed, I can start to become a little bit more picky because I don't have a lot of roots and I can check them individually. I know these roots are good, so I'm gonna stay away from them, but these roots are not good anymore. So I can cut all of these off. And also here in the back, I have some good roots. This one is not good anymore. So I can start to remove them individually because now everything is a lot, a lot easier to see. Now, it's okay if you leave a few dead roots on the orchid. The idea is not to leave a whole lot of them because they will just spoil the new medium and you will have to repot the orchid yet again, stress it out, damage the root system yet again. So do as good of a job as you can initially. If you have the time and availability to really inspect all of these roots, go ahead and do that. But if you don't, leaving a few roots on is okay. Just don't leave way too many of them. One thing my orchid has is a withered pseudobulb and it's right here in the middle of the pseudobulbs. So I have to remove it, but I don't need to actually cut the rhizome. The rhizome can be perfectly fine and intact. So what I will do is go at the base and see if I can either twist it, which I can't because I'm damaging the other pseudobulbs or just rip it out with your nail. There it is. And this is perfectly fine now. The rhizome is okay. This is the only thing we needed to remove. And of course, a few of these dried leaf remains, if we can remove them safely, we should. Here I do have another pseudobulb which is cut, but it looks to be okay for now. If in the future it's gonna go bad, I will just remove this one separately as well. But just be careful that you don't damage the new growths. These are very, very important. If you cannot remove one of these sheaths because you are damaging the growth, let it be. All right, so my orchid looks pretty clean. I will clean up my tray and come back with the hydrogen peroxide bath. One thing I like to do with new orchids is use hydrogen peroxide 3% on their root system. This is the same substance you can find in pharmacies and you can use it straight from the bottle if it is the 3% concentration. This will make sure that I eliminate snails and snail eggs and I do talk about it in my 10 tips for repotting video, so you'll learn more about it there. Now I'm just going to spray the root system thoroughly. In my region, bush snails are really common with Oncidium orchids. I'll also spray in between the pseudobulbs, but there is no need to spray the entire orchid. Just the root system, the base of the pseudobulbs and rhizome. The pot that I will use is a four inch slotted pot from Repot Me in Transparent. I do have a whole video presenting these pots. If you're interested, you can check it down below. And what I want is for the pot to be able to fit the root system, which in my case, we can see it can fit it, but also leave a bit of space here for about two years worth of growth. So if we can imagine that in two years, this orchid can produce about three or four pseudobulbs, you can see that we do have quite a lot of space here. The medium that I will use is a combination between sphagnum moss and bark chips. My environment is rather warm, so the addition of sphagnum moss greatly helps me with my own sidiums. It makes sure that even if I don't have time in particular days to water, the medium will not become super bone dry way too fast. So with that said, let's start potting. I like to mix my mix directly into the pot because I can better control the quantity of my materials. When arranging Oncidium orchids, it's a great idea to put the oldest side of the orchid next to the edge so that we leave more space in the pot for the new growth. At the back of the orchid, it is highly unlikely that we will get new growths, but here is where most of the new growths will appear. So I will continue to add medium. And here we are, my orchid is potted. I am also going to check that I don't have big air pockets inside the medium, which I don't, so everything is okay. The next thing that I need to do is to water this orchid. Now the exact technique of watering an Oncidium will have to be up to you. You can just run water through the pot 
for about 10 seconds or so, let it drain and then put the orchid back in its place. But you can also soak the orchid in a separate container. This is especially useful if your environment is rather dry or warm because it makes sure that all of the medium is completely soaked. You can let the orchid be for about five minutes or so, then drain all of the water, remove the excess and put the orchid back in its place. You can keep the orchid in a decorative container or in a dish. Even though Oncidium orchids don't have crowns, they do have new growths and they can be susceptible to rot. So when you water, make sure that you don't leave water standing in the new growths. If you get water inside these developing pseudobulbs, you can remove it by using a paper napkin and let it soak up all of the water. New growth rot is not always going to happen, but sometimes it could be that in our homes it might just be a little bit more humid or ventilation might not be adequate and accumulation of water which doesn't evaporate can lead to rotting. I will have to rewater it when all of this medium is almost dry. Through a transparent pot we can see this because the medium will change color but if you're unsure you can always just put a finger inside and check to see if it's still a little bit moist. So that is about it on Oncidiums for today. You have more information down below in the description. You also have links to Repot Me and to the products that you saw me use in this video. And I will also share with you down below my videos on sick orchids and sick Oncidiums. I have a video in which I repot 10 new and kind of sickly Oncidiums. So you can see more techniques and more cases in that video below. But I hope that this video shed quite a bit of light on Oncidiums, the different types of Oncidiums. I tried to cover as much information as I possibly can, but if I think about it, I can spend an entire day talking about Oncidiums. They are just so varied and wonderful. And before we end, I would like to thank Repotme once again for sponsoring this video and this entire series. And with that said, you know the drill, like or dislike this video below, subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos, tutorials, experiments and all sorts of orchid related subjects, follow me on Instagram and Facebook and visit my second channel for other types of videos. And with that said, I'll see you next time, bye!